I'd like to welcome Small. everybody to this uh, very interesting <coughs> seminar this week, and especially warm welcomes to our guest, Professor David Patterson. This is the second time we have the honor to welcome you here. Many of us enjoyed your very informative presentation on some of the Nazi roots of Hamas ideology last uh, November. Now we are going to approach a different topic, which is the philosopher Emil Fackenheim. Uh, David Professor Patterson holds the Bondum Chair in Judaic Studies at the University of Memphis, and the uh, floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I should start by saying, on a personal note, I think, uh, Emil Fackenheim, as some of you probably know, lived very nearby, mm -hmm. on uh, Al Roy mm -hmm. Street. I knew him only the last 10 years of his life, but I had uh, the good fortune to spend you know, quite a number of hours with him, uh, mostly listening to him, uh, not so much talking with him, but listening to him. Um, Fackenheim uh, was the one true philosopher that I have, I think I have ever met. Uh, sort of what Jacques Maritain said about Henri Bergson, the only philosopher I ever met is Henri Bergson. I think I can say that about him of Fackenheim. Um, he was uh, unusual, if not extraordinary, in that Fackenheim read as much history as he did philosophy in order to uh, develop his thinking and try to understand the world around him and, and uh, humanity and good and evil and the things that philosophers try to understand. Um, he didn't come to engage the Holocaust. And what, I, what I will discuss is his engagement with the Holocaust. Until, in a serious way, until 1967. And uh, it was the occasion of the Six Day War that brought him to that engagement. Um, for Fackenheim, it was, uh, it was a very um, difficult engagement, not just because of the subject matter and the event. He, he spent uh, several months in Sachsenhausen himself, and uh, after, right after Kristallnacht. <coughs> until March or so of 1939. Uh, he and his father and mother got out of Germany uh, in August 39, just before the war started. His brother did not get out. But he, I mean, he had seen the Nazis firsthand. He had been in a, a concentration camp, although they refused to call himself a survivor. Um, so he had dealt, he had faced that evil, but he was, Fackenheim was also deeply engaged with German philosophy. Um, I think few people knew more German philosophy than the fact of him. Um, one, of, one of the difficulties for him, as I said, was not just the, the nature of the event of you know, the Shoah, but ways in which uh, some of the philosophical implications lead to certain collisions with the very tradition that he loved so much the German philosophical tradition. Um, so Fackenheim, I think with some courage, you know, confronted that, confronted ways in which uh, that tradition may have contributed to a, a, an intellectual outlook that helped to pave the way to the Holocaust. And he, uh, he confronted what, you know, what the implications are for a Jewish response. I mean, what would make a Jewish response Jewish? Um, and it remained difficult to him, uh, in my view, till the end. He could never quite, he could, he could never let go of his, uh, his love for um, German philosophers, General Hegel in particular. Um, in order to try to simplify his, his philosophical response, I'm, uh, I'll focus on three things uh, that fall under the heading of a tikkun attained through a tshuva. Uh, and perhaps his most, I think his, his uh, most advanced work, uh, To Mend the World, he discusses uh, a tikkun through tshuva as, a, as what would constitute a Jewish response. So what does it mean? Um, he takes these terms you know, together. One is connected to the other. And he addresses these terms in three from three perspectives, from in three different senses that are related. One is uh, what he takes to be a, a return to tradition. 
as a Jewish response to Shoah. The second is uh, a, a recovery, mending in the sense of recovery, what he calls a recovery from an illness. And then the third is to address the, the open-ended the open -ended nature of the process of return and recovery, that it's never, it's never settled, it's never closed. Um, with regard to return to tradition, for, from a philosophical perspective, which is where, what he's, where he's operating, this entails not just uh, you know, opening up Torah and Talmud and studying every day and, and you know, davening uh, three times a day. It's not just a return to a, a belief system. Uh, it, it, for him, as a philosopher, return to, to, to tradition entails transformation of the categories of thinking already. Um, and it's, it's certain categories of thinking that contribute to the Shoah itself. For example, certain line of thinking. Um, when Fackenheim examines modern intellectual history from, say, Descartes on, and certainly with the German philosophers, Kant, Hegel, uh, Fichte, Hegel, uh, Feuerbach and, 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 and that line of thinkers. Um, the history of that thinking is the history of thinking God out of the picture, making God more and more irrelevant to thought, more and more irrelevant to how we understand who we are, what human life means, uh, the nature of good and evil, and so on. One of the key concepts uh, certainly from Kant onward, is the concept of autonomy. Uh, to be free is to be autonomous, and to be autonomous is to be self-legislative. Okay. So that uh, God is relegated to the status of a concept, a uh, concept that you derive from the good that you generate out of your own reason. And not what? Not the creator of heaven and earth, who, uh, not the commanding voice from Mount Sinai, uh, not the one who enters into a covenant. So you have, you know, in other words, the God of the philosophers over against the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The return to a tradition is return to the ancient God of Israel, as Fadenheim puts it. Um, the God of the philosophers is a concept, uh, a principle. You don't cry out father to a principle. You don't uh, enter into uh, a, a covenant with a concept. Um, as Aristotle puts it, God neither loves nor is in need of love. Uh, so the, 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 the best the, that, that line of you know, German thought can do is to uh, argue for the need of the concept. We need the concept. Okay. Uh, Nietzsche looks at this and says, well, God is, God is irrelevant. God is dead. Um, in Fackenheim's own critique of, of Hegel, his, his, his one whom he regarded as, uh, regarded as the greatest philosopher who ever lived, he says with, with uh, Hegelian thinking, God and the self come to occupy the same space. I mean, the ultimate end of history is that God and man are, will become one. Okay. Um, Feuerbach, the Neo-Hegelian, then makes God into a projection of the ego. And then finally, as I said, Nietzsche says, who needs God? God is, God is uh, it's irrelevant. Uh, now, this poses a very interesting problem for Fackenheim. Because Fackenheim, as, as you may know, uh, got his smicha from Leo Beck, um, who was, you know, at, at his, in his time, the most famous uh, voice of liberal Judaism, what in the States we call Reform Judaism. Fackenheim held a post as rabbi for a year in Toronto, early before he took his position at uh, the University of Toronto. Um, when Fackenheim looks at the Jewish reaction to the, to the, to the Kantian you know, shaped enlightenment, he makes a statement such as saying, um, 
if autonomy is taken too far, it would mean the end of Judaism. Okay. Uh, that when God is a concept, all you, the best you can do is to have you know, in, in, internal feelings of a spiritual experience and no genuine relation. So this engagement with the Holocaust leads him to a critique not only of the philosophical tradition that he had embraced, but also the, the Jewish reaction to that in the 19th century that he had also embraced. So he's, he's got a lot of turmoil. Um, you know, going on inside of him. Um, he, he's, he says that uh, when God is, is reduced to a concept or a principle, um, uh, when God's existence becomes tenuous you know, and irrelevant, then Jewish existence be, is in peril. Without the God of Abraham, you don't have the children of Abraham for long according to Fagner. So, when, when, so one, of the, one of the ways in which he tries to uh, respond to this situation is to uh, return to categories of creation, revelation, covenant, commandment, instead of what? Causation, uh, reason, uh, natural accident, self-legislation, instead of command, being commanded by God. You know, uh, this is why uh, you know, Kant as you may know, called for the euthanasia of Judaism. Uh, why Hegel pronounced the Jews to be a, a, a people with a slave mentality because the Jews operate according to commandments from outside of them and not through the reason, their own self-legislating uh, laws, you know, rooted in reason. It's not just whim, but uh, it is systematic. Um, it's not for nothing that Fackenheim invokes what he calls the 614th commandment. And he takes it to be a commandment in, the, in every sense that the commandments from Sinai are commandments. He compares uh, Shoah the, the moment, uh, to a, that moment of revelation, you know, going back to Sinai. And um, as he once said to me, if it's the 614th commandment, that means there are, uh, there are 16 613 others as well. You see. Uh, it's not a new commandment. It's, it's a commandment added to the others. Now, one of the things that uh, the return to, to, to tradition does is to return us to a relation to God and not just a reflection on God, uh, which in turn is tied to our relation to one another. The recovery from an illness, which is my second category here, um, concerns the recovery from the illness of an indifference of one person toward another. Um, and it's related to you know, the philosophical issue, uh, the philosophical categories that he's, he's breaking from, um, where, where you have in, uh, where you have being associated with thinking, the Cartesian, I think, therefore I am. You know, my thinking is the ground of my being. Um, that leads to a radical isolation of the self within the self. What, uh, uh, what in the case of Heidegger is known as a, the, this, the solitude of being. Um, there is no essential connection between one human and another. What, what uh, in other words, what authenticates my existence is not my relation to another, but my internal resolve and my internal will. Um, this, of course, is, is rooted into a certain understanding of what a human being is, what, what makes a human life matter. And when Fackenheim uh, what, that, what Fagenheim sees as a recovery from this illness of it, which is manifest in a collapse of relation to one another, the illness of indifference, he sees a, the, the tikkun of that, the mending or recovery from that, uh, in a return to the category of revelation, which opens up in human relation. Okay, you still with me? Uh, let me, I'll give you a perfect example. Some of you perhaps have children. 
Uh, some of you perhaps have held your baby who is five seconds old in your hands and looked into those eyes taking the first look at the world and experience a moment of revelation. Suddenly you're wise. Suddenly you know what must be done. You know what there is to love. You know what the truth is. It's nothing that can be deduced. This is why it's not good for the, for the man to be alone. Right? The first time you see the loto, after every day of creation is told to accept second day. Every day is good, 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 good. Sixth day told me, oh, what's low tov? It's not good for the man to be alone. Even, even hanging with God is not enough. Why? Because you have no relation to God without the relation to another human. Uh, Fackenheim sees this to be one of Buber's contrib contributions to thinking that in, in the human you there is a trace of the eternal you, as Buber says in, in I and Thou, if you know that word. Um, this has, it, you know, so you have a moment, of the, the category of revelation leads to this category of, of human relation. There's the revelation from the Creator is a revelation concerning a connection between the children of the Creator, the, the, those whom the Creator created. Now, this goes to the threat that Judaism poses to the Nazis. And it's a philosophical threat, as Fackenheim sees. What, according to the Nazis, <clears throat> gives a human being value? Um, First, the first thing that gives a human life value, that makes a human being matter, is an accident of nature. Right? You happen to be born what they determine to be Aaron. Already you have more value than another. Uh, that value is determined by a concept called Razenzela, race soul. Uh, the race, the accident of nature, is the soul, is the essence. How we think is tied to the blood in our veins. Therefore, Alfred Rosenberg, the famous Nazi ideologue, declared it's not just Jewish blood, but Judaism that poisons the Aryan geist, the mind, the spirit. Right. Uh, if you're an Aryan, you take on another level of value and substance and depth through resolve or will. Okay, a will to determine good and evil, truth and lie what is lawful and unlawful. Um, Jewish teaching concerning the value of a person can't live in the same universe with that, with that position. And it's a position that is derivable from certain categories of German philosophical thinking. I'm not saying all of German philosophy is Nazi thinking, but there are certain <coughs> categories that play into the hands of Nazi thinking. Um, Heidegger, as you know, was a card-carrying, unrepentant Nazi. And what's the, what's the threat? What's from the Jews? What's the, what's the value? The value of person, according to Jewish teaching, has nothing to do with anything that can be observed. Right? It's, it's that every human being is created in the image and likeness of the Holy One that, that makes that person matter. It's not how uh, old or young, uh, smart or dumb, fat or thin, handsome or that you are it has nothing to do with it. Um, first, number one. Number two, we also have the teaching that all of us come from one, from Adam. Why doesn't God start with two? It takes two, usually. Um, in uh, the Tosef to Sanhedrin, it says God begins with one so that no one can say to another, my side of the family is better than your side of the family. There's only one side of the family, and we are all interrelated. Uh, none of us lives in the solitude of his being or in the solitude of his thinking. Each of us lives in the midst of relation. That's where the soul abides. Yeah. And that, but the Nazis cannot abide that view. Um, this, um, if I can do just one little aside here, uh, Levinas has an interesting uh, 
remark on uh, Leviticus 1918, uh, and it's not, he, he didn't invent it, but he cites this from you know, Talmudic teachings, that the Kamocha means that is love your fellow human being, your neighbor, because you are, you are like that. You, that. you are the love, the loving relation that you show toward your fellow human. Who, who you are lies in that relation. Not in your will, not in your resolve, not in your autonomy, not in your self-legislation. Okay. So the, the, the you see that now you see that the categories of commandment and covenant uh, and revelation are tied to its recovery from the illness, which is a recovery of human relation. Um, What happens with the outcome of the collapse of human relation is, is murder. Um, Backenheim, one of his says, fame, one of his famous statements is that the murder camps were not a byproduct of National Socialism. They were its very essence. Um, National Socialism is about the elimination of lo tirzat thou shalt not murder, which is in turn about the elimination of a higher relation, an Ochi Hashem, right, the first commandment. And we were taught that a number of the uh, commentators teach us, uh, Chaim Benatar, for example, and among them says, don't read the, co the commandments one, from one to ten, top to bottom, read them from right to left. An Ochi Hashem, lo I am God, don't murder. The, 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 the status of one has to, is connected to the status of the other. So the Nazi assault on not just human beings, but the very meaning and value of a human being is an assault on Anokhi Hashem, I am God. Uh, recovery from an illness is a recovery then from both human to human relation and a recovery of a higher relation, which is made of commandment. And what is commandment? What is mitzvah? The root of mitzvah, we're told in the Talmud, is tafta, which is connection. A commandment is a connection. It's not an order or something. You know, God, it's not the God doing his power trip to order us around. It's God establishing a connection to, to him by commanding us concerning the connections to one another. Because we can't be connected to God if we're not connected to one another. So this recovery from the illness and recovery of tradition are interrelated. Now, when we go to the third point, is what is the open-ended nature of this. Um, this is, the recovery of a relation is a recovery of, a, an, of an essential, fundamental responsibility that can never be filled. Uh, it's a recovery uh, uh, of a relation uh, from an illness and removing into a relation where the debt increases in the measure that it's paid. Uh, the more re we respond, the more responsible we become. And this is an opening up of the infinite in the midst of human relation. It's an infinite responsibility. Uh, never settled, never fixed, never overlooked. It's always unsettled. Um, I think it, it, this is a, another topic, but uh, in, my, in my view, one of the reasons for Jew hatred in the world is that the very presence of the Jew in the world is unsettling. Uh, the Jews uh, don't allow us any sleep. The Jews don't uh, allow us the comfort of fixed formulas and ready answers. There's always more. There's always more. There's always, you know, you know there's always the kol me'odecha with all the more that we have to bring to bear. And there's always more. It's always, it's never settled. Um, the voice, the commanding voice of Auschwitz is not uh, a voice concerning, you know, now, you know, now you must believe something, but now you must engage in an action that can never be over with. Um, it's an action concerning not just the survival of the Jewish people, the commanding, the 614th commandment is simply stated, don't allow his, uh, Hitler any posthumous victory. 
see to the, the future of the Jewish people as a Jewish people. But why should the Jews survive? I mean, what, what makes the Jews, what's different between the Jews and Hittites? Or, you know, why should the Jews survive? It's not about saving our skin, it's about continuing our testimony. Because our testimony, as, as Jewish people, concerns the connection between don't murder and I am God. It's a testimony concerning the sanctity and holiness of human life. Um, the, the philosophical tradition, uh, the, tr the, the syllogistic tradition, the tradition in which uh, where reason is the highest court of truth, it is a tradition that would arrive at the end of the proof, so to say, the Q, so that you could write QED after your proof, quotas demonstratum, right? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's totalizing, uh, it would uh, settle everything, uh, it would put everything into, you know, again, the fixed formula and the ready answer. Um, the the open-ended nature of the, the relation and the, the status of the tradition and so on, lies in the, the eternal question. Uh, that we, that's the question put to Adam, where are you? Uh, the question put to Cain, where is your brother? What have you done? And these are questions that are unsettling and can't be settled. Um, we're always having to say, Hineni, right? But Hineni, here I am, is a movement. It's not a Nikol, it's a Hineni is a movement toward the one who summoned. And the movement is, is, is unending. It's without completion. Um, so if this is, I mean, this is what Fackenheim sees to be you know, essential to a Jewish response. Now, where does he see this manifest in history? I uh, mentioned that Fackenheim was a philosopher who read as much history as he did philosophy, and he read a lot. He was, he was a well-read person, you might say. Um, Fackenheim sees this unfolding in history most dramatically in the Jewish state and in the city of Jerusalem, where he spent his, the last 20 years of his life. Uh, and not, not for nothing. For Fackenheim, uh, Jerusalem was not a place to live only. It was a category in his thinking. Um, Jerusalem, it, he said, is, he, Jerusalem itself is the tikkun, is the movement of return. Um, even those uh, who, who come to dwell in Jerusalem are continually, he would say, returning to Jerusalem. The return to Jerusalem is an ongoing uh, process. Um, he says uh, that Israel is an, what he calls an orienting reality. And what does that mean? It, it means that this, the, the state of Israel is not just another state. It is itself a fundamental truth, represents a fundamental truth that shapes all of our thinking about reality. Um, thinking that is, uh, that is uh, guided by some notion of the holy. Um, the holy land, the holy city. Is the holy land is different from the you know, uh, Medina Israel, right? The Jewish state is not the same cat in a, as a category of thinking as holy land, but they're, they're interwoven. Uh, Jerusalem as the capital of, of the state is not the same as the Yer HaKodesh, but it's the, the two are interwoven. Um, and they're interwoven in human consciousness. If I, if on my way back to uh, the United States on Sunday when I have my stopover in Amsterdam, somebody, I tell somebody I was just in the Holy Land, they're not going to wonder, well, was that Argentina or, or Libya or where? It's part, it's part of human discourse, human consciousness, that this is the Holy Land. Uh, if I, if we speak of a heavenly Jerusalem in many traditions. Uh, you can, you can evoke a heavenly uh, Jerusalem in many, at least around many tables, um, and no one will, will, you know, look askance at you, but no one speaks of a heavenly uh, London or a heavenly Tel Aviv, even, 
or even of a heavenly Memphis, uh, Graceland notwithstanding. <laughs> um, so it is a category of consciousness, but when it becomes a category of thought, what does it mean? It means that Jerusalem, it means, now don't start throwing stuff at me, it means that the Jerusalem, the, Jew, the Jews have no claim to Jerusalem. Jerusalem claims the Jews. Jerusalem summons the Jews, and often in spite of ourselves. I was mentioned to uh, my, my good friend Elliot that you know, I had to do some business with a bank locally here. <laughs> and I said to Elliot, you really got to want to live here. <laughs> it's not always easy living here. It's, and, it's, and I think for many of us, uh, I don't live here, this is one of my sins, but uh, for some, I think maybe you could, maybe you could correct me, maybe some live here in spite of themselves, precisely because there's a deeper, uh, higher summons calling. It's, it's a way of answering he naming, here I am. Uh, certainly that for Fackenheim. And Jerusalem holds the significance in the tradition to which he wants us to return. Um, the, I mean, in the, uh, the Yalkut says that there are 70 names for God, 70 names for Torah, and 70 names for Jerusalem. Uh, the Talmud uh, teaches us that there are three who are known by God's name, the righteous, the Messiah, and Jerusalem. Uh, in the Kabbalah, if you're inclined, uh, there's a teaching that points out that when you spell out the, the letters of Shekhinah, and add them up in the gematria, it equals the gematria of, Jer of Yerushalayim. So for, you know, in the tradition, Jerusalem is not just another town on the map. Uh, Jerusalem is a part of a testimony, part of the light that is shined unto the nations. Um, this, is, this is why the, the, the windows of the temple are designed to let light out, not to let light in. Um, the Jewish response to the Shoah as a return to tradition, as a, as a recovery from the illness of indifference among humanity, and as something that's ever open-ended and ongoing, finds its, its, its highest expression in the Jewish state, in the holy city. Um, and that's why Fagenheim lived here and in the end died. I think that's all I have. Time, obviously was influenced by the threat to Israel and and the quite miraculous resolution of, of the conflict. Here we are 42 years later. The status of Israel, the Jewish people, is transformed in the eyes of the world from up to down. The, the miraculous perception of, of these events, how do you think he would respond today to the historical situation, I don't know in terms of his own philosophical categories, I'm sure he would still advocate a 614th uh, commandment, but uh, I know it's hard, how can a person possibly speak in, in, in memory, right. but, it, but, it, but it's the question which, which in any case burns in me at the moment. I have a lot of other questions, but there are other questions. Well, um Fackenheim uh, was very, a very careful reader uh, and uh, words, concepts. He was very sensitive to language, certainly uh, you know, in, in the aftermath of, a, of an assault on language by the Nazis. Um, in, in a lot of the uh, press, uh, a lot of the uh, political discourse and pressure Israel is getting, a lot of the rants on Israel, uh, and all of the, I would say most of it, uh, involves twisting meaning from words. Um, the, just, I was, I, I was, again, it reminds me of conversations I've had with Elliot, that the, just the, the use of the word settlement, use of the terms like refugee camp, uh, use of terms of di like displaced people, uh, genocide. Geno well, not to mention genocide, human rights violations, war crimes, you know, let's investigate Israel for war crimes in Gaza, uh, the genocide in Gaza. Uh, he would, I, I'm sure he would be the first to point out that, um, that lying underneath that discourse is a Jew hatred. It's not about justice. It's not about even peace. Um, 
It's about legitimizing Jew hatred and delegitimizing the Jewish state. So um, I think he would be extremely distressed <coughs> at, at uh, speeches from all sorts of you know, figures, uh, both those who pretend to be friendly to Israel and those, certainly those who are not so friendly. Um, I think he would point out, for example, that the Holocaust denial in the uh, Arab Muslim world is not about something that may or may not have happened in history. It's about delegitimizing the Jewish state. It's about Jew hatred. It has nothing. You know, my students ask me, how can anyone deny the Holocaust? And I say, you're making the mistake of supposing they're arguing about history. They're not. That's not it. Um, so, I, you know, I, what would, I'm sure his, his political position would, would be just as much to the right as ever, if not more. Uh, what, he was known for to be. Yeah. Right what, what do you think he? How would you think he would explain or talk about the fact that uh, there are a lot of Jews involved in this now campaign to be the Jew? How would that? He had a special sense of what a Jew is. Yes. And and he had a sense of something like that, something that couldn't be removed and something special and something. Yes. So how do you think you would deal with that? I mean, I'm asking these questions which are... You know. uh, well, I mean, I come from the United States where we do have some Jewish intellectuals who are very hostile toward Israel. A few. And yeah. so, <laughs> a few. Um, we have some here, too. We have some here, too. A few. This would, I think this would be most horrifying to him of all. I mean, Akhmani Najadi can understand. Norman Finkelstein. Is, is, is a horror. Um, being, I, don't, I, you know, how, I don't know how he, he might explain it, um, but I, I'm not sure what more to say on his behalf. I just want to ask you one small question which always bothered me. Hegel was himself. He didn't like the people who didn't work on Saturday either very much. How did Professor Frackenheim deal with that question? I know he because he was uh, so deeply attached to Hegel. He loved Hegel yes. to the end. Yes. So how did he deal with that aspect um, of that? He, I mean, he, was, I mean, he knew Hegel inside and out. He'd read everything Hegel wrote, and including you know, uh, napkin scraps and stuff. Um, <laughs> when I, and, and I was always careful not to push him too hard, because I'm, after all, he's Emil Fackenheim, and I'm nothing. Yeah. But when I asked him, what about this, Hegel says this, Hegel said that. He says, yes, but you know, uh, Hegel had a certain admiration for the stubbornness of the Jews, whereas he had no admiration for the stubborn, stubbornness of the Arabs. I mean, the, the fact that the Jews are hanging around sort of undermines the, the Hegelian view of history, right? The dialectic. Yeah. Uh, in a way, but that's why they're so stubborn. But I mean, Hegel once said the Jews don't have the decency to fade away. <laughs> no, but the, the whole intellectual tradition of the West, <coughs> the anti-Semitism, which is so rooted in it, the fact that he didn't confront Hegel as a, a quite strong representative of that. I think he gave Hegel a pass. Yeah. <laughs> We'd like to do that. I think he did. No, I mean, you know, I mean, we all, you know, have certain thinkers we, we can't think badly about. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad you pointed out it is, it's not just the, the, the tradition of anti-Semitism in the West is not just a Christian phenomenon, it's philosophical. It's yes. philosophical anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Howard Weissman. Um, David, hi. Two questions. One of philosophical nature, the other more, a little more practical. Um, when you um, spoke of Fackenheim and in relationship to Blooper, Idao immediately popped up. That's where they, they're similar. Are there areas where they, where they differ? That's well, one question. Yeah. The other is a different nature. Um, you're speaking um, lovingly from a basis of Judaism, Zionism, Eretz HaKodesh, Yer HaKodesh, where they integrate with one another. I share that, obviously, that probably everyone on this table does. There are a lot of Jews out there, 
be referring to some in a different way politically, don't necessarily share that. Good Jews, supportive of the state of Israel, but take a, a different point of view. When you talked about, you said the Holy Land is the Holy City, people would immediately know where they are. Jokingly and somewhat seriously, there are Jews who live in Memphis, you know Memphis, mm -hmm. who speak about the Yerushalayim of the South. And there are Jews who live in Baltimore, or Toronto, or other places who speak of, you know, Jerusalem of the North, Jerusalem of America, Canada, whatever it may be. And and, and they <laughs> New York. And they I don't know, anyway, make that analogy. But but they, they say it somewhat kiddingly, but somewhat seriously as well. And 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 a a Jewish leader that I know quite well, who is very involved with Israel, very involved Jewishly who felt that the, he, his life and the life of Judaism in America were ever threatened for whatever reason, he wouldn't come to Israel. He would go to England before he would come to America. To come to Israel. <laughs> no, but that exists. So if how do we... Read this <laughs> how do, that was a few years ago. I don't know if it would be the same today. But it, how do we bridge that gap? How do we bridge well, that gap between... And part of it is philosophical and part of it is practical between... He who believes in, works for the state of Israel, committed Jew, but yet he's, there's still a gap be between himself, herself, and, and the holiness factor. Um, I don't know. That, it, but it is the know, Jerusalem of the South, the Jerusalem of the Canada, or it's the Jerusalem of, Jeru the Jerusalem of, right? Memphis isn't the, the Paris of the South, or the, you know, or the Tokyo of the South, it's the Jerusalem. Yeah. It's, I mean, Jerusalem is still the category. But I'm, um, how do we connect that gap? I mean, we but all they know. They leave Memphis because they feel they have everything there. They do. So I practically, I practically everything. <laughs> um, you know, it's the, the, so some Jews are, or like Humphrey Bogart and Casablanca. I stick my neck out for nobody. Right? I look out for myself. I don't care about the next thing you know, he's sticking his neck out. He's doing he's doing something. Uh, I, we all know Jews who are proud atheists, but don't miss a Seder. I have a very close friend who's who's uh, sort of in that category. And uh, as a woman, and she's, and I said, but do you have a bicep? Do you have a mezuzah on your door? Of course, I'm a Jew. <laughs> so, the, I mean, what's what's deep in the soul is not always what's articulated in the intellect. Um, I mean, I, I would say that about many Jews who, who are devoted to the Jewish state, who are devout Zionists, um, who are religiously Zionists, but may not be, you know, wear a keep or anything like that. Or not, but they don't, I mean, they don't do, they don't do what, uh, what we say, the, you know, the Dati do. But there's a certain, they, there is a certain connection between that soul and the Holy Land, uh, I think. Um, I think the worst possible thing Jews can do is to rag on each other about their observance and their, you know, how dutty they are or they are. We don't, that we don't need, in my opinion. We got enough, we have enough people giving us a hard time without giving each other a hard time. Um, as for, how, you know, the, how Fackenheim and Buber differed, um, the most, the, the major way in which they differed is that Fackenheim undertook a prolonged, profound philosophical response to the Shoah, and Buber was almost silent about it. Didn't know what to say. Um, and it's not because he didn't see it. I mean, he, as you know, everybody here knows, he lived in Germany, left Germany, came to Israel, and so on. Um, that's the, the, the main difference. I mean, Fackenheim was much more steep in the German philosophical tradition than Buber was. was much more deeply versed in that and saw on a deeper level, I think, certain ways in which certain elements of that tradition contributed to 
National Socialism. It doesn't mean, I'm not saying Kant was a Nazi, I'm not saying that at all. The Nazis were Nazis. Um, nobody but the Nazis were Nazis. But there are others who have their problems with they're not Nazis. <coughs> uh, but, having said that, there's certain ways of thinking that open the door to uh, reducing a human being to the status of animal. It was uh, uh, Joseph Soloveitchik once said, the question is, is a human being a specimen or a child of God? As soon as a human being is a specimen, then you can justify all sorts of things. So that's, I mean, Buber didn't engage it on the philosophical level as deeply as back in It wasn't his, his background. I wanted to just make an observation because something came together for me as we're sitting here this talking. And of course we all struggle with the how did we get here and the world hates us from where we were in 1967 and the transformation. But when you talk about the he gave me as an infinite answer to the summons and the discomfort that this generates in people because of the challenge, then our strength ultimately had to lead to increase anti-Semitism and increase this country in the world with us. Yes. It was inevitable. The, yes, but the, uh, again, I would say that the strength you're making, of... Uh, you know, you're making a face of what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to hear. No, no, I'll say it. Yeah. <laughs> it just came, as we're talking, it's sort of... But the, the, the strength doesn't lie in, just in the fact of hanging around. It lies in a certain... Mm -hmm testimony that we engage in, uh, but it's a testimony that implicates. It's, you know, where's your, the, the Jewish question is, where is your brother and what have you done? That's what, that's the question you want to make go, when you want to set, resolve and, and put out of the way. Um, you know, when my, when I, I teach a course in the Holocaust, and one of the things that my students like to write about, uh, or engage with, the righteous Gentiles. Because they, I mean, they're so overwhelmed by the darkness that they want to see some light there somewhere. I said, but be careful when you look at the righteous, because they will rob you of your excuses. <laughs> it's by their example. And they had lots of good excuses not to help, many of them. Um, Jews do that. By the, the just the, by the tradition and the teaching and the testimony that the Jewish presence represents, it, it robs people of their excuses. And you know, we will kill anybody who robs us of our excuses. Say it again. We will kill people who rob us of our excuses, who who shake us from our sleep. Hello. Yeah, I would like to ask you a different question. Uh, Professor Frackenheim's autobiography was a kind of lament mm -hmm. for the loss of German Jewry and, and his world. But since you knew him and had these long conversations, I'd like to ask you, do you have a sense of what his sense of his accomplishment at the end of his life, what did he feel that he had really done? Well, he told me that the, 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 the thing he, he wanted most and, and the thing about which he feared most was being, as far as his own life went, was being understood. And he would go, he gave the example of Hegel. Hegel famous, only one has Only one, one has understood, understood me, and perhaps he, not he even that one. Yeah, he too can And Fackenheim repeated that to me several times, is wanting to be understood. Uh, because I think he had a great sense of urgency about a, you know, a message that he had to transmit. Now, the, was the epitaph on, uh, on uh, you know, German, was it German, uh, the German Jewish community, or it's in the title of his book, is an epitaph on the Jews of Germany, or something yes. like that. Yeah. Um, that's, it's, I mean, this goes to uh, a time that I spent with him in Germany. He, in 2002, he was invited to Germany and was contemplating, you know, should I go? I mean, he was already, by then, it was, it was kind of hard on him to travel. Um, 
it occurred to him that he might die if he were to undertake it's like a three-week trip. Um, he had been invited by uh, the, the new Jewish Studies program at Potsdam University, uh, by the, uh, the German community, Jewish community of Berlin, and it was, it was German agencies, the Zentrale after Judentums, and, and uh, they inviting him. Um, and I spent, I, I was three weeks, a week in, there with him. And he, he went, saying every time he was introduced, I heard him speak, uh, three times that week. Uh, I come to Germany not as a German Jew, but as a resident of Jerusalem to address the Jews in you know, Germany. Um, having said that, he had, it was evident, he had a great nostalgia for Germany, a great love for German philosophy, um, what, what, you know, the, the highlights of German culture. Um, but he had a greater love for Jerusalem and for the Jews. More than he loved German philosophy, he loved the Jews. And he, wanted, he was fearful of not being understood. That's, that was, he wanted to be understood. Uh, this may not be a philosophical question, and I know you're a professor of philosophy. How much of Jew hatred worldwide do you think it's related to the envy of the Jews? I do believe that at this one, this next point, I'll argue with anyone, that the anti-American sentiment is envy. They're jealous. Now, can you take that over and say that they're, they're also envious of us? I don't know. Well, there's, there's good reason to envy the Americans. It's an affluent society. Uh, it's a society that, uh, apart from its own civil war and, and the wars with the native populations, have never, you know, wars have not been fought on their soil, except you know, from their couple, the major wars, civil wars, is the, the biggest, and it wars with the native population. Um, Americans are most powerful, you know, in terms of militarily, economically, and so on. Um, I'm not sure there's a lot of reason to envy the Jews. You know, I, I have a student who, who, who has a Jeremiah complex. He wants to be Jeremiah. I said, you want to be Jeremiah? Do you know anything about Jeremiah? And he does, but he, Jeremiah's life was, was no picnic. Um, as Elie Wiesel once said, who would be so stupid as to want to, as to envy us? Who, 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 would, who wants this? Well, can I follow? Um, do, I'm but sorry. I'm not sure. What's the envy? What's the envy? Okay. Uh, I, uh, people who are sitting here who know me well, I am an Iranian-born Jew. And I lived, I finished high school there, and I spent some years there afterwards. Most of my life I spent in America. But with my Muslim friends, whenever we really, truly, you know, we sit down and discuss the question that relates to the dislike of the Jews. Finally, it ends up, maybe it was a two-hour conversation, the last hour and a half ends up with all the things about the Jews that they wanted to be, and they are not, they can't be. And that's, maybe that's the basis of my thinking. Um, so I, I don't think, I, I just don't think envy explain, explains much about you. In my opinion, it could be wrong. Two questions. Two questions I wanted to ask. One was, did um, Fackenheim ponder the issue of what was going to happen after there was there were no more survivors alive to give, you know, direct testimony, and what the implication was going to be? And the other question, I'd like you to comment since you opened uh, up the issue of the righteous Gentile, because the Museum of Modern Art, probably about 10 years ago, did a, an exhibit called The Rescuers, in which they had uh, an artist had gone around and taken pictures, and then they had descriptions mm -hmm. of the people. And the most fascinating thing to me about that exhibit was almost all of the people 
when they were asked, why did you do what was so unusual, didn't relate to what they did as being unusual, right. but related to it as that was what needed to be done right. for another human being, and didn't perceive it as being special. So I, if you could comment on that. Well, with regard to uh, the passing of survivors and the, you know, the loss of the, you know, the living memory, uh, it's something that did concern Backenheim very much. I mentioned that he read a lot of history, but he also read a lot of diaries and memoirs. Um, he was very much engaged with what the Shoah was with respect to this person, this person, this person, with you know, an individual with a name, and not with the just the overall historical forces and so on. Um, that the loss of of that memory uh, has much implications that that go beyond uh, what opening doors to Holocaust deniers and this kind of thing. Um, it's it's a loss of a of you know voice of the of the tone in the in the presence that it becomes a tone um, and it's a loss of an insight you know I have when I when I teach hope the Holocaust I you know, almost always uh, at, at some point have a survivor to my class when I can because then that was the, the survivor can transmit more in the, you know an hour and a half than I can in a semester, I mean, it, it captivates my students. There's a, there's a transmission of, and a transformation of the listener into a messenger. That doesn't happen as easily when it's, you know, black and white. It's the human present. That concerns me. Uh, and in that context, uh, he was aware and I was aware, I mean, I've had arguments with Holocaust scholars, so-called, who, who say to me, uh, you can't use Testimonies, diaries, and, and memoirs from survivors because they know the least. They know the least about it because they were there. They were too close to it to really see. It. Not like, not like you know, uh, us historians. We see the picture. We know more than that. That's something that back in high, that concerns back in high, That you know, that attitude that they're they're irrelevant. When if you want to get at the assault on the soul. That's where you have to turn. Um, and of course, with the part of the righteousness of the righteous is that they don't know they're righteous. You can't be righteous and know it, right? You can't be humble and know. Yes, I'm. I'm very humble. <laughs> uh, you can't be one of the 36 and know it. Um, that's that's an added part of the righteousness. And the fact that they say, well, you know, that's what had to be done. Uh, reminds me of a line from Emmanuel Levinas, whom I like a lot. He says, to know God is to know what must be done. Um, they're thinking in, in, in certain categories already, they're, from which you recognize this is what must be done. Um, of course, the stories of uh, Jews who were hidden, Jews who were saved, are quite varied, and the attitudes of people who helped them uh, motives and so on. Uh, I read an account from a woman who was saved by a Polish guy who would, you know, rant and rave against the Jews, saying, you know, Hitler's doing the right thing. Why don't you turn me over? Well, I can't do that. I can't do that. You know, that kind of case. But yeah, I would say that's, that's part of the, the, their righteousness is that they don't know that they're right. Two questions. One, uh, very short, particular, I'm curious to know, uh, we were talking about the um, concerts that we did in Holocaust. Are there non-Jews coming to this? Almost all of them are non-Jews. Almost all of them are OK. Now, the other question is, and what we were talking about now, would you uh, elaborate a little bit about this notion of the 600 uh, I was already intrigued by this uh, notion because, um, after all, uh, what can I also say that uh, Auschwitz is the only place in uh, time in history where a relation was with the people. And 
and find only silence, a no, blank, a mute. If there's a God, it's God who's mute and therefore not present. Um, but Auschwitz hears, at least in the aftermath of voice, uh, a commanding voice. The, I, I'm not sure, okay, if, he, if he thinks that there the covenant was abrogated, I think that's how he puts it. The relation is broken. Right. It's a proof that one has to stop being Jewish. I'm not sure he claims it's a proof that you have to stop being Jewish. It says something like this. In fact, he, he criticizes Rubenstein for, for making a statement like that. Right. Right. That's, that's, his, that's one of his main critiques of Rubenstein. But in any case, um, Whether or not God was at Auschwitz uh, doesn't determine whether or not we will be witnesses to God. At least for fact. In order to have any standing to cry out to God, where are you? We have to be in a position to say, here we are. In other words, uh, I, I can't bring an accusation of infidelity if, I, if I'm not faithful. If I abandon Torah, I have no ground for asking God, where are you and where are you in your Torah? Um, number one. Number two, I think Fackenheim, although I never heard him refer to this, uh, this, this passage from the Sifre, but um, where it says, when you are my witnesses, I am God, but when you're not my witnesses, it's, it's as if I weren't God. Um, the, the commanding voice is not just to continue to, to live as Jews, but to, to open up a place where God can be present in the aftermath of a place in the time where God was absent. I don't, I don't think I, that Fackenheim says, therefore, let's abandon Torah, or therefore, let's not be Jews. If we were logical, but this is his critique, precisely his problem with Richard Rubenstein. That much I, I am sure. Of. That much I am sure. Of. Uh, first of all, I'm very glad. That we did this, or that we are doing this. Um, first of all, because Emil Fackenheim, of course, came here in the last years of his life, was a fellow of the center for many decades, uh, came here frequently, was a neighbor. Uh, so I always wanted to do something in, uh, in memory of Emil, and besides that, I'm personally grateful to him because one the last thing he wrote was in uh, forward for uh, one of my books. So. Only that, suddenly I'm very happy that uh, uh, that this was an occasion to bring you again here. So, two, 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 posit two, two positive things which came together. There's one thing which really uh, I made a face about, and I wanted to make a face already early. Because, uh, uh, look, I, and then I have another uh, question, but uh, the first question. The two things uh, which we have to in my opinion, which are, uh, one is totally unacceptable. And the same, you cannot justify, uh, find a logical reason for, uh, a justifiable reason for anti-Semitism. Uh, you can say there are reasons in society why the anti-Semites need it. Uh, that is a, uh, that's very, very logical. If, uh, you uh, ask why the Catholic Church uh, needs it. Uh, you ask, you ask Augustine, and he gives you the, the the perfect answer: they, uh, that the Jews are 
really ugly people, but uh, it helps us promote our business. Uh, well, does it say so? Uh, Saint, so he markets it in a different way, but that's essentially what this idea was. And I, I have difficulty with anybody who, uh, who tries in one way or the other to explain that uh, any semitism has any rationality, objective, whatever, whatever ground. Uh, also, uh, lots of times. So, uh, so that that really, and I felt that you were, uh, you were perhaps over the borderline on that issue, or wondering mm -hmm. what fuck I'm talking about. That. My second question, to a totally different nature. I always had the feeling that he somehow didn't make it here. That whereas he was a, a recognized figure in the in the international world, in the English speaking world, and treated with the great respect uh, he merited, absolutely. That is, I don't know, perhaps Alfred can say that better because from Hebrew University, but that somehow Israeli society uh, huh? Yeah, okay. How do you can take a guy? Now, I, I have one, at least, not being a philosopher, but in reality, I have one great advantage over you. I know two. I have met two real philosophers. <laughs> but uh, uh, I felt that, that that was, I mean, these are obviously two totally different questions. I always felt that that was. There were a few, like, you didn't choose this. Maybe, you know, French. Yeah, but look, I felt that fucking I was really an outstanding. And now it's, uh, the more uh, more time passes, it uh, it also becomes more more obvious. It was really an outstanding uh, uh, an outstanding thinker. But <laughs> okay, I found the rational reason. <laughs> well, I mean, just the people in this room could speak to Fackenheim's reception here much better than I, since you know yeah. this community much better than I. No, I just wanted to ask Max, but when you said there's no objective reason for anti-Semitism, did you want to say there's no justifiable reason? Or do you want to say... Uh, I, it, it no, look, if you want to, no, there's no justifiable reason. There is, let's say this, uh, the ira there is, uh, I, th I see it as a highly, let's say, irrational element which people try to rationalize. I would, I would take total disagreement. I think there are many, many different reasons for that which are objective in the sense that you can verify that these are reasons that people believe in sociologically. That that's a mean justified. No, not, not justifiable. Not, not justifiable reasons. What, objective reasons? Absolutely. Why the Christians or the certain, uh, why the Catholic Church hates the Jews, why the Islamic world hates the Jews, why, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll even get Professor Patterson angry at me, why, why I believe that one basic root of anti-Semitism is envy for all kinds of things, and, and without getting into all, making a long speech about it, it's okay. Well, you know, yeah. without and making a long envy speech about it. Envy of the proletarians in Amsterdam uh, before the Second World War. No, no, envy. Which those, those, are all subjective, those are all subjective terms you're using. They aren't objective. I envy. I'm sorry. Envy is subjective. Envy. Not objective. What's the, what's the empirical envy? Envy. That there is envy of the Jews in the world, there's no objective evidence in that? Of course, no, it's tremendous but objective But the, the, the actual motivation of envy is, is a subjective motivation, subjective feeling. Envy, 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 why. envy of the envy Jewish peasants in, in, in uh, Subcarpathia and Rutania, if you read, read Envy Obre. for the Nobel Prize winners. Envy for the, the wealth that the Jews have in the world. In every, almost envy, every community that they've been a part of. Envy, en envy, envy, envy for the for place the they have in the media. Envy for the attention given to Israel disproportionate to its place in the world. It goes on and on and on. If you are a person and you're I mean, sitting in the, the world... The Norwegians keep telling me uh, that uh, they don't want all the attention I give them in the world. No, no. But I am half, half of the attention they get in the world. <laughs> no, no, that is objective because it sells books for you. <laughs> what you're saying is... <laughs> what he's saying. 
Well, you know, let me just, I refer to my Iranian background. Uh, when I left Iran in 1953, the percentage of literacy, yeah. literacy was about 20%. But yet, among the Jewish male, it was virtually zero. Now, that's, that's not, there's nothing subjective about that. The Jews on average were more educated but than Muslims. The Jews on average were wealthier than Muslims. And, you know, these are not, but, these are but not the subjective. envy of that is a subjective view. Well, the other it can be verified. A lot. The upper class of the sense of relative deprivation was, uh, was absolutely wealthier than the Jewish cellar dwellers which I have seen there. Yes, ma'am. There, there's a certain mystique to the Jews, I think, that, that uh, also contributes to this. We've been around for a long time. And I think that also the development of other religions, they have to denigrate us to an extent in order to free themselves up. Well, in order to supersede us. That's right, yeah. exactly. Um, most of what I said about anti-Semitism was, was my view and not so much that. Um, I, don't, I, I do have, I think, uh, you know, I can try to understand why the Christians say to choose, why the Muslims say to choose, why the philosophers say to choose. But that, uh, I, I don't buy the fact that, and, and I'm not, I know you're not saying this, I don't think we should, if, if it's inexplicable, then we shouldn't try to say anything about it. Well, that's uh, something else. And, you should say that it's inexplicable. But, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, we all can talk about, you know, why do the Christians uh, in medieval art portray Jews in, in this demonic fashion? And you can try to respond to that, that, uh, well, if the Jews know who Jesus is and they say no to salvation, there must be something evil, demonic about them. So they portray Jews in a demonic fashion, which is something worthy of hatred. Uh, but it, I mean, and you can talk about the philosophers, uh, denouncing the Jews because they have a slave mentality, uh, you know, and for whatever whatever the context might be for why people hate the Jews. Um, but frankly, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm never quite satisfied with the explanation. But I still would maintain uh, that, you know, that you're not satisfied with the explanation. It's, it's not a reason not to try to respond or understand or, you know, articulate what's going on with that hatred. We often yeah. hear that if we didn't, if Jews did not exist, there would be a group created to be like this, to be the butt of of, of civilization. And it's of course, very uh, very close to us these days is the, the what happened at the Holocaust Museum in Washington yeah. yesterday. And the person who did this said he hated Jews and blacks. Mm -hmm. So hatreds are very often overlapping too. And as long as there is hatred. Any group that say that the Jew, that the Jew, uh, that the philosopher says that the Jews are slaves, and now uh, leftist opponents say that we are a handful, uh, then we are everything. I mean, uh, yes, 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 we are communists and bankers, communists for uh, the yes. right and bankers for the left. That's I mean, right. No, but that's I mean, that it doesn't sound dramatically uh, rational. That's no, no, but it's an excellent but, but point that the Jew morphs into anything worthy of hatred that you want to make. Well, that is the essence of the story. I mean, if Jesus is good in the old days, then the Jews are uh, the Antichrist, okay? And then uh, you project your Antichrist as the antithesis of what the Christ is. All Jews except one. No, he was, <laughs> yeah, he was he was an Aryan, as you know, <laughs> and now he's a Palestinian. <laughs> Look! Right. This variable is the, the hatred of the Jew. He is! There's a book by Susanna Eschel on, on uh, the Jew as, on Jesus as an Aryan, and, uh, and the Palestinian Jesus is uh, being heavily promoted. <laughs> That's true. And we can tell you yeah, about that. Yeah, also, yeah. Okay. Well, for the whole law, that's the same. Well, except the Quran claims it was no persecution. Look, <laughs> look, if you look at Is the... That? Thomas can show you the cartoons we have from some of the papers where he's been. 